Well, hey, we're, we've got a small audience here, so this will be hopefully an interactive um, conversation. So I'm going to be just sharing my my journey, right? The, yours will differ, but you know, I think um, you know the military really helped me personally, and some of the lessons I learned from there. Um, you know, from when I started straight out of high school, I had no clue if I was even going to start college, right? I mean, I was so disorganized, and it's like, yeah, I need to do something. And for me, the Marine Corps kind of kicked me into shape, right? I was actually going to the Air Force recruiter, um, but the Marine saw me there waiting for the Air Force guy and pulled me in and said, hey, can do you think you can handle the challenge? So, you know, I, I actually, any of the armed forces I think would have been very good for me. Um, but, you know, personally, I started out with just a high school diploma, you know, and in some cases barely, right? Because I did not like school and I just started my PhD recently, right? So I made the transition from, you know, going from not quite sure what I was going to do in my life to starting my PhD just recently. So, you know, the, and I directly attribute that to the military, right? The Marine Corps specifically, but, you know, anybody I've ever talked to in the military has had kind of a similar journey. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey, some of the lessons learned that I had. And, you know, since we're you know, a smaller audience, I, I'd love to get any questions from you. Or if you want to find me on LinkedIn, um, you know, just look for Paul Love, um, you know, the Los Angeles Paul Love. I will gladly accept and I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions. So, again, I started out, um, got out of high school, wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. I married my high school sweetheart right after boot camp. Right. I had a kid at 20. Right. And I'm sitting here in the military, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And I picked up some very valuable lessons while I was in the military. And one of them was humility. Right. You I learned to be humble. I went on ship. I was on um, the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit in 1993 off the coast of Yugoslavia for a while. And, you know, there's a, a mop, um, a mopping class. So I was an E3, right, a Lance Corporal. So guess who gets to mop the floors on ship? Um, and. You know, I was like, are you you're out of your mind? Why am I going to go take a mopping class? Right. And a very um, sage gunny of mine an E7 said, you know, listen, you need to approach every learning opportunity as something you're going to learn from somebody else. Right. Don't be so cocky that you think you know what you're doing more than somebody else. So with that lesson, um, I went to the class and I was truly humbled by it because I truly did not know how to mop a floor. I mean, I learned a very valuable lesson that day that education and constant um, you know, inquisitiveness and constant learning were gonna help me in my career, in my life. So after I got out of the military, um, I was a sergeant, I had two kids, right? I was very you know, concerned about what I was gonna do in the future. Um, and I, I started a job at a company as an engineer, right? And I took some of the habits from the military with me, um, not necessarily good ones, like I called everyone sir and ma'am, and when people do that to me now, I actually feel weird. Um, so I learned, you know, you gotta, you have to kind of adjust for the, the civilian world. Um, but, you know, I did this engineer job and, you know, my constant wanting to learn actually helped me progress. I had created a Linux website that um, a startup company bought and I did a startup for a while, massively failed, right? I thought I was gonna be rich, but as every dot com happened, it failed, but I learned a lesson, right? And every time I've lost a job or moved on from a job, um, I've learned a valuable lesson from that. And I'll talk about a big one here in a bit. Um, I went back to the other company, became a manager. You know, and the thing that kept driving this is the things that other people weren't willing to do, I was willing to do, right? So when I was in the Marine Corps, I wrote some of the procedures that we used in our local uh, office, right, in, in our unit, um, because no one wanted to write documentation. Well, I started writing documentation, and I didn't realize that opened up a very big door for me. Um, from that simple act of, hey, no one has documentation, I might as well write it. Um, it started a career to where I, I've written nine books, right? Because I started that, that one document, people started to find me, say, hey, nobody else wants to write this documentation. We know you do. My career actually has been built on writing documentation, right? So every company I've gone to, I've written our information security standards because nobody wants to do it. Even as a CISO, I've gone into organizations like, well, we just do what feels right, right? So I've had to go in and write documentation for the organizations. And again, that was a military thing. No one else was willing to do it. I applied a little bit of discipline. By the way, I don't like writing documentation, right? It's not something I enjoy, but I use that to couple it with the learning opportunity. So by writing documentation, I actually learn and I force myself to learn in a very consistent manner. And, you know, again, 
since other people don't want to do it, that resulted in books on Linux. Um, you know, I did hardening Linux, visible ops, security, a bunch of books. Um, and it wasn't about things I was necessarily an expert in always, but I became very, very good at it because I was able to articulate to others and teach them how to learn. So after the, the five to 10 year mark, um, I started to become a, a more senior manager, a director. Um, you know, and I was very, very focused on my title, right? So being a sergeant coming out of the Marine Corps, you know, I was always looked at the lieutenants, the captains, right? It, hierarchy and rank was very, very important to me. And I started hounding one of my managers and I said, hey, why am I not a VP yet, right? I'm a director. I'm, I'm running the entire security program for this organization. I need to be a VP. This person uh, said something that has changed my life. He said, okay, Paul, so if we promote you to VP, what's next? Well, senior VP. Okay, what's after that? Um, I'm president. I mean, you know, he, he made me, he asked me a question in a very non-confrontational way that challenged my way of thinking about my whole career. Um, and in fact, if, if you find me on LinkedIn, you'll see I've gone from director, senior director, information security officer, senior manager, right? So you would think I had gone down, but really the way I looked at it, and that's helped me is, you know, every time I've made a career transition, it's helped me in some way because I always approach it as, even in jobs that I didn't do great at, I learned something from it, right? One of the most prestigious jobs that I've had, um, I, I, I miserably failed at it, right? Now you couldn't tell from the deliverables, right? Because I delivered every single thing. I opened up a massive market for this company, very, very large company. And I was miserable. I hated every single second of it. And it was because it was a, not a good culture fit for me, right? And I learned a valuable lesson from that, that if the culture of the organization doesn't fit you, right, you need to move on and you need to recognize it. I mean, I was, it, it was such a, a jarring moment that I actually wanted to get out of the information security field. I was like, I, I'm clearly not suited for this, right? Then I went to a job that seems like it was a lower job because it was a less prestigious company. Um, but it actually helped me reinforce my confidence and helped me propel to where I am now. So, you know, and that doesn't make the company that I left a bad company or it doesn't make me a bad person. It just wasn't a good fit, right? The company is exceptionally successful with their culture, but it wasn't the type of culture that I was good at. So one of the things I would recommend is if, if you're in an organization and it doesn't feel right, move on. And even if it's a smaller role, right? That smaller role will help you build your confidence. And, you know, when I left that large company, I was incredibly embarrassed, right? I, I did not want to tell anybody about my failure there. Um, but then as I started to recondition how I looked at things, I realized it wasn't a failure, right? It was a lesson learned. My family was healthy. Both my kids were okay. You know, I came out of it with, you know, my, the ability to move on in my career. So, you know, your perspective is incredibly important. So that's kind of a third lesson is make sure the culture fit, recognize when things don't work and move on. And so from there, um, you know, I, I eventually move, I, I found a great mentor and I've worked for this one mentor three times, right? So another recommendation I give you is if you find somebody who's really good, find a way to maintain a relationship with that person. Um, and I'll, her name is Debbie Wheeler. She's the chief information security officer at Delta right now. I followed her, her and I have worked together three times in my career, a very large organizations. And that's because one, she appreciated, you know, the, the, the candor, right? The transparency that I always gave. I always told her the problem, but I always told her the solution, but her and I've maintained a very strong relationship built off of that initial thing. So if you find somebody who's really good, um, yeah, there the whole slide now. Uh, if you find something that's re find somebody who's really good, maintain a relationship for with them. And even if you haven't had the opportunity to work for them, if you find somebody who's like, hey, I really like what they've done in their career, I want to know more about them. Open yourself an approach, and I'll I'll volunteer if anybody in this room wants to contact me and you just want to chat. Right, I may not have a job for you, but if you just want to talk about, hey, this is what I'm going through, I'm absolutely happy to help. Right, because I want somebody to be able to do that to my kids. You know, my oldest is 25, my youngest is almost 21, right? And I would love for somebody to be there for my kids, um, you know, but also veterans, right? I, we all share a common bond and I'm here to, to help as well. But even if you don't, you know, contact me, find somebody who you appreciate, open up a dialogue and a conversation. A lot of people think that CISOs aren't approachable, 
right? Like you don't want to talk to them or, oh, they don't have time for me. If you, if you start the engagement and say, hey, you know, I just want to understand career, where to start, right? Most of us will talk to you, right? Because we've all come from the same place, right? I needed mentors in my career and you should look at um, that the same way. So, you know, again, I went from becoming a director, a senior director, then I went to a senior manager role because I learned that title doesn't really mean much because in financial services, an SVP may be the same as a director at another organization. So don't get hung up on your title. Right, I've actually talked to people who've said, well, I can't take your job because it's too low of a title. But it's like, well, the breadth of it is far greater than you know, the one that you're at now and you have the opportunity to learn. But don't close up the opportunities because the opportunities that I thought uh, that I didn't realize were good for me at the time, like writing documentation, ended up propelling my career and, and giving me much more than I even realized. Um, so in the future for me personally, the thing I'm looking for is, again, I don't care if, I, if I'm you know, a CISO the rest of my career, great. Um, I'm actually looking at becoming, I, I just became a chief information security and privacy officer, right? Because that constant wanting to learn, my organization said, oh, hey, you know, maybe you take on this privacy role as well. Um, you know, I went and got multiple certifications just because again, it helps force me to learn in a way. And plus I want to understand, and I took this from the military well as well as, I want to understand the other side, right? So in this case, it's not the enemy. Right. It's I want to understand, you know, who the people I work with are like auditors. Right. Um, I tell this story a lot is that, you know, I went and got my audit certification because I kept getting audited. It's like, gosh, these guys are just beating me up. Right. Why do they keep destroying me and telling me I'm the worst person in the world and I can't design a process. So I went and got my CISA and um, ignore the slides, by the way, um, I went and got my CISA and, you know, learned why auditors do the things they do. Um, in fact, one of my best friends um, was an auditor who failed me on my first audit at a large organization, and he became the best man at my at my wedding, right? So, and actually, I just I've hired this person two times at two organizations, right? And this auditor was the one who was always the worst to me, but I learned to respect what he does. So, you know, the value this is actually um, the value from that is, you know, develop those relationships, understand, um, you know, the people you can work with. Um, you know, and then from there, the, the biggest thing I would say, the takeaways I've always had, build your network, um, continuously improve yourself, right? And by the way, build your network. I'm an extreme introvert, extremely introvert. I'm probably going to go home after this and lay down and go to sleep, right? But you have to force yourself to do things that you wouldn't um, expect. I mean, I've talked to large organizations, 1,100 people where I'm the only person on stage, Right. And that is the thing I dread the most. But, you know, the military taught me is like, hey, go embrace it. You know, if I can survive boot camp for 13 weeks, I can survive anything. So go take those chances. And even if you're uncomfortable. Right. So, um, you know, continuously improve yourself. Always learn. Always learn any class you can get. I'd recommend taking it, even if it's a mopping class. Right. I mean, and that sounds silly. Right. But if somebody offered me a mopping class, I'd say, hey, maybe I forgot from 93, you know, how to mop. So let's go do it again. Um, you know, get excited about it. Um, you know, again, see opportunities um, where you may not realize they are. Again, writing that first SOP because no one else would do it led to nine books and my entire career has been, the, the first six jobs out of the military were all about the, my ability to write a standard and an SOP, right? And I had no clue that when I did that first document that that was gonna lead up to where I am now. Take risks. Um, you know, that's easy to say, right? Especially if you, if you don't have a family or your kids aren't at home, but you know, taking the risks have always helped me. I've gone from um, jobs where, again, the title was much lower. And in fact, the pay was significantly lower in some cases, but I looked at the opportunity and said, hey, this is a leadership opportunity. And eventually, you know, my salary increased beyond what I had had before um, because I took that risk and I, took, I identified the opportunity to be a leader in there. Don't focus on title. I think I've talked about that a lot, right? In the military, title means a lot. Um, in the real world, it doesn't mean as much as long as you don't let it affect you, right? If you go into a um, job interview, if someone comes to a job interview with me and said, yeah, I did this and I did this and oh, I took a kind of a drop here, right? You've already set yourself up for failure, right? Go in and talk about what you've done at organizations, how you've made a difference. And that's what people really care about. They don't care about your title. I don't care about titles, honestly. When I interview and I've interviewed a lot of people, your, the title you had at previous companies doesn't mean a lot, right? I look for 
Do you have the desire to do the job? And are you capable? And if you're not capable quite yet, I can work with that because I can train you. But if you don't have the desire and the passion to do information security, uh, there's nothing I can do to help you, right? I won't bring into my organization. And then learn from your mistakes. You know, I've had many, many mistakes in my career. I've deleted logs accidentally that I got yelled at about. I've not done the right thing sometimes um, for an audit process and the auditor say, hey, that's not right. And I just owned it. Own your mistakes, but also come away with it knowing that, you know, if you're not, if you're, you still have your family intact and you're still able to work in the, the field that, hey, that's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So sorry about the slides. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll get that worked out. Are there any questions? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about my personal journey or what it's like to be a CISO or, you know, information security in general. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was, um, you know, I had actually had a job to work in the defense industry and I decided to not take that because for me, um, I wanted the flexibility and the freedom to not have to follow somebody else's rules. And they tend to be very rigid, um, especially in information security. Right. So I was in the um, I was a 2651, a special intelligence communicator. Right. So there's very, very specific rules I had to follow for anything I did. Um, so for me, it wasn't a good fit. But if you like that camaraderie, that's great, um, because there is a risk in the civilian world that you're not going to have that type camaraderie that you would have had in the military. I mean, and that's one thing I've missed. I'm actually at an organization where I feel that we have that tight camaraderie. But the one that I failed at, right, it wasn't like that. The, the organization was um, very much about competing with the different business units. And again, that's not a bad thing. I'm not judging them that that worked out extremely well for them. That didn't work for me because I want to collaborate and I want us all to succeed as uh, together, even if that means less success for me. So you have to think about the culture aspects. If, if you really like the military culture and the government culture, great. Um, but you're, you'll have to make a decision eventually. I haven't. Well, I guess that let me recant that. I've not stayed in one industry. I've primarily been in financial services, but I've gone to many different industries. Um, so. Don't look at it as like, hey, I'm just a, I have to work in the government sector for the rest of my career, right? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Has your career changed? How many of those decisions were geocentric? So where did this bring you in mm-hmm. when you were going up or down and mm-hmm. the title or capacity within the organization? You have to make certain compromises to the wearable. Yes. Um, and I, you know, some of those I regret, right? Because I had to move my kids around a lot. So I moved, I've lived after I got out of the military in Ohio, um, Seattle, Oregon, California, Kansas, um, North Carolina, right? So, and that's a 20 year, I've been in security for 30 years, but in a, you know, an 18, 19 year period, I moved all around. I moved for the jobs because luckily my family was comfortable being flexible because I had, I had my um, children very early, right? I was a Lance Corporal when I had my first kid. So they were used to the lifestyle of moving around. Um, but as I look back, it's like I, I could have stayed in one location, right? But I took the easy way, right? I, if I saw a good offer, I just went for it instead of trying to contain my um, searches within a geographic location. So if you have the ability to move around, um, you know, go for it. But if you don't, don't think of that as a limiter, right? Family's most important thing, right? I, everyone says that. And 20 years ago, people said that to me and I looked at it and it's like, well, yeah, but I got to have money to feed them and a career. Um, I look back and, you know, I, I wish I could have spent more time with my kids, right? They're, they're amazing men. And luckily I, they, it all worked out. So don't, don't feel like it's a limitation. Any other? Yeah. Oh, I'm done. Okay. Um, well, oh, I have five minutes. Okay. Well, good. Even better. Um, are there any other questions? Again, th- this is, um, there's no holding back. Ask, ask me anything you have, you want. Okay, good. Thank you. Don't leave me hanging up here. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually, and I'm going to answer more than your question here in a minute, but as well, but um, the privacy gap, um, privacy is where security was probably 20 years ago. Um, and it's emerging, so it's super exciting. It's like, all right, I get to do some new cool stuff because I'm very comfortable with the security part of it. Um, so bridging the gap, it's like, 
it's a natural transition. Um, if your organization will support you on it, go for it. I've seen organizations that are very much a, it needs to be in legal, right? Or it needs to be X. I actually got lucky. I work for the general counsel. So it just happened to, I just get to own privacy. So I think more security people are going to need to um, know privacy. And I went and just got all my privacy certifications recently, just because, again, I'm, I'm always curious, but that helped build my credibility with my management to say, hey, he can do privacy as well. Um, the other thing that I would say, and this isn't directly related to your question, is um, making the transition from a technical to a non-technical person was incredibly difficult for me. Um, now, I still understand technology, but as a CISO, you, there are roles you can be a technical CISO and a non-technical CISO. In my role, I'm a non-technical CISO, so I'm not touching technologies and I'm not you know, configuring firewalls. I understand the basics still, right? And I understand Linux and so forth, but I'm not doing that day to day. So if you, you know, make sure that you're thinking about your career, again, not just from the title, but what do you wanna be? If you wanna be a technical CISO, start to manage your career to do the technical stuff, but also the management stuff, right? And if you want to be um, technical and engineer your entire career, you know, start to focus on that and don't worry about the title. You know, become become that more focused um, individual. So, for me, uh, you know, I I go to classes and I go do trainings on my own and you know set up my own lab just because I still want to maintain my technical portion, but I don't get to do that at work anymore, right? I get to talk about the concepts, but I don't get to touch anything. So. That's just the route I've chosen. I've chosen to become more of a governance type of CISO as opposed to the technical. So try to think of that if you can now, like if you truly enjoy the technology part, make sure that the roles you're taking will help you get to that technical CISO role. Um, but if not, it's okay, right? So that'll change how you look at things, whether you go and you know take Unix classes or firewall classes, or if you go take communications classes. And the one thing I always recommend to anybody that I mentor is that you know the technical stuff your company will pay for that right and it's easier for me to train someone technically than communication wise right so i always tell people read marketing books read sales books seth godin by the way is one of my favorite authors he talks about marketing um, very simple to use it's very simple to understand and he actually changed my life by thinking about things differently but we're all in sales and we're all in communications and if you have that skill that you're going to get hired at a lot more jobs because you have to open that door by having that communication. Because I typically talk like military person, um, you know, like, yes, sir. Um, well, we're going to, you know, I throw every acronym at the book, right? I'd be like, well, we're going to have DLP and we're going to do X and Y. And my management will look at me like, what are you talking about? So I've learned to communicate to say, well, we're going to have a program that watches for privacy or private information, right? So you know, try to try to really work on your communications, but also try to read sales and marketing books. It's incredibly amazing how much you can learn from the salespeople. Because we're again, I'm in sales every single day. I'm selling to the people who work for me. I'm selling to my management. I'm selling to our customers. I'm, I have to sell my ideas to them to in order to get what I want done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can, it's very easy to take no risk, but you won't pr proceed, right? And I, when I interviewed at my last company, I said, I can secure this company out of, I can secure this company out of business very easily, right? I just turn all the computers off, not allow anyone to do business, but that's not really how business operates. So I've actually just shifted how I think about security security for most companies is not the reason why you buy a product, but it's definitely a reason why you would not buy the product. So I always use the analogy and I use a lot of analogies that, you know, um, you know, it's like a car, right? You don't go buy a BMW because it has amazing seatbelts. Like, man, those seatbelts are awesome, right? You don't go and buy it because of that. But if it didn't have seatbelts, you probably wouldn't buy it if you have a family. So if you change your perspective about security, that you're there to help management and to help articulate risk to management and what's an acceptable level of risk that kind of changes your mentality and that you're not, um, you know, you're not responsible for all of it, but you are responsible for ensuring that people are aware. Um, so it's mainly about communications, but 
you know, again, I didn't have gray hair probably four years ago, um, right? And I became a CISO about three years ago and all the gray. So it is a very, very stressful job, but you have to go into it knowing that, you know, if, if I, the culture is why that, that's why the culture is so important, excuse me, is that I know that my company won't fire me because of that, um, that they would support me. But if you work at a company that would fire you over that, well, you may want to look at a different organization. So I think that's all the time I have. Um, again, find, feel free to find me on LinkedIn, reach out. I'm happy to help anybody. Um, you know, appreciate your time. Thanks.